Hey golfers, and welcome back to Second Swing Thoughts, your favorite golf podcast. And today we're back recapping a very eventful Ryder Cup with Pierce Lanou, uh, Sunday Swing Rider on SecondSwing.com. And uh, let's just jump right into it, Pierce. A very kind of crazy Ryder Cup in some senses where we had a little bit of drama. We had, um, I would say, a surprising, uh, I guess, lopsided battle. I mean, I... I think when we talked about it and previewed it, we expected kind of it. We expected it to be close in some sense, and it kind of it got there a little bit at the end. But the way the Europeans took over from the get-go and sort of already made it a, a, a chase for the team for the U.S. team was not something I expected. Yeah, the uh, I think the biggest thing for for the Europeans was their big three. Yeah, they showed up and. And they showed up in a big way. And I, I remember watching. So I ended up, I did stay up pretty late on on Friday. Of course. Um, and the first thing I see is Victor Hovland holding that chip on the first hole. Yep. And before he hit that chip, the announcer was like, why is he not putting this? And, well. <laughs> yeah, that set the tone right away. You yeah. Know, you heard the, that was kind of the first big roar from the crowd. Um, and... Speaking of Hoblin, I know we said so much about him and his improvement. I think it comes down to that short game with the wedges and how he's been able to consistently contend in majors. He's he won the Memorial, winning these big tournaments. I know he's worked really hard with the ping team on his wedges to make sure those are dialed in, and also he's just improving his short game. Uh, and so you saw that on display a lot at the Ryder Cup. If he was out of position, which wasn't often, but when he was, he was able to get back into position very quickly with those wedges and save a score that was needed. So, but you're right, the big three between John Rahm, Roy McIlroy, and Victor Hovland all played phenomenal golf. I believe McIlroy and Hovland were the two guys that went all five sessions. And I think McIlroy was the, was the one of the two that went four and one. And yep. I think Hovland also won three or three and a half points as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I jotted down some notes for today. Uh, the big three for Europe, so Rom, Rory, and Victor, they were nine, one, and three. Yeah, that'll work. Which is ten and a half points. So you're getting ten and a half of the fourteen and a half you need from three guys. You're you're in a pretty good spot. Right. Versus... And we talked about the the roster being potentially I don't not weak at the bottom, but you know it was you sort of had um, streaky players at the sort of in the captain's picks of the European team. And in, in some senses, if you get that good of a performance from your top three guys, you don't really need the bottom of the roster, right? Yeah. So there's just the dominance from that perspective. They were just way more comfortable. Obviously, the home crowd played into it. But also just Scotty Scheffler didn't play that well. Um, some of these Americans that have a long history of Ryder Cup prowess. You know, Jordan Spieth and Justin Thomas didn't look too sharp. And so, I mean, the combination of those three guys dominating, a lot of those matches, I guess, were against the, Ameri the, the stronger American players, and they just didn't really show up. I mean, talk about a beatdown when you have a 9-7 and seven oh my goodness. result between, what was it, Hovland and, uh, we have the pronunciation now. Of, of Ober. Ludwig Ober. Yeah. Uh, and then Scotty Shuffler and Brooks Kepka going. Uh, that was unbelievable. How about yeah. that? I, I slept through that session and I woke up and I had to like do the double take and rub my eyes when I saw the score. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. Nine and seven is a total beatdown. Yeah, that's that's unbelievable. If you if you told me Scotty Shuffler and Brooks Kepka were gonna lose nine and seven, <laughs> I probably wouldn't believe you. And and like I didn't see that match either. I just saw the result and I. Like you said, I couldn't believe it. I right. mean, but but to to kind of go back to that that European core, those top three guys. If you compare that to the the three on the U.S. side, which I identified the U.S. big three as Scheffler, Kepka, and Morikawa. Uh, those guys, if you compare it, it's two six and three, three and a half points versus yeah. the. The ten and a half for the Europeans is just not. You're not going to win. No. If you if you do that. No. Um, I think. Uh, I mean, moving forward in Ryder Cups, I, I think you have to throw in Max Homa as one of yeah. the big. 
three Americans. Yeah, he was the only American. He, was, he showed up and played really well. Made some clutch shots. He had the chip in. Kind of walked that one in. Yeah. To, um, in that session with Harmon, and then he obviously had the big putt on Sunday to win his singles match, which at the time kept American hopes alive. Yeah. And the way the scoreboard was lined up at that point, the U.S. had a real shot at mm-hmm. a miraculous comeback. Um, they just need a couple matches to flip, which wasn't out of the realm of possibility. So kudos to Max Homa. Definitely the uh, American MVP of yeah. the Ryder Cup, I think. Well, he's the only American with a winning record. Right, so there you go. I mean, three and one, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, phenomenal. Three, three, one and one. He played all five. Yeah, so yeah. phenomenal for him to, you know, he's he's talked all the time or so much about how much that Ryder Cup means to him and to be on the team, and uh, he showed up. He showed mm-hmm. up and, and, you know, gave a pretty strong, compelling case for him to be involved in the future Ryder Cup teams as so long as obviously <clears> his <throat> performance stays up there, which there's no reason it right. won't be. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, one other thing I kind of wanted to touch on before we we dive deeper was kind of the you mentioned that the <clears throat> you know when you have the three guys in Europe putting up ten and a half points you don't really need the the bottom guys but they actually performed pretty yeah, well I mean Bobby McIntyre didn't lose a match I think he was two zero and one yep um, and then Ludwig Aubert I think he was two and two. Yep. So those are kind of a couple of the rookies that we talked about last week that we thought might kind of be that those dark horse picks to kind of flip the mm. flip the table on the U.S. But obviously, you know, it ended up not really being close. But but yeah, the the, Euro, the Europeans they they showed up and yeah yeah they did. It I mean, was it was just not really a contest. I mean, like you said, Sunday there was kind of. There was a moment. There was where a there moment was, where you thought maybe, yeah. but then you know when Scheffler lost that match or the, tied that match yeah. to Rom, where he kind of looked like he had it locked up there. I think at that point it was pretty much over. But yeah, so I wanted to ask you, you know, as before we I guess talk about or some of the strategies involved or, or what have you. Um, just it's I mean the past what four or five Ryder Cups now have been not really close. Um, They've been kind of decided relatively early on Sunday when you have 12 matches and, you know, the last four or five of them are, are playing their remaining holes without anything on the line. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to ask your opinion on the setup of the event in the sense that, like, should it be... I mean, because right now, when it's in America, <coughs> Team USA gets to set up everything. They set up the course, they set up... Um, they pick the course, right? They can add tees they can you know like i know the the whole thing that you know paul easing around the broadcast kept repeating over and over was how team europe took a really analytics based approach and tried to get as many 180 to 220 yard approach shots as possible because that's where the europe was statistically much better than the u.s so is there is it almost too strong of an advantage between the home crowd home course home course setup for the home team where maybe that needs to be balanced more yeah, I mean, maybe maybe there's something to that. I could see it. I mean, you would think you would think the team that gets to to set the course up would have the advantage, but then again, you know, they also talk. The Americans were there a week in advance, scoping it out and and practicing, and you know, they they studied every inch of that course. So I wouldn't really say that's an excuse for for the performance, but. I I suppose it would be an advantage Um, and maybe you know in the future if there was some sort of committee that neutral party yeah that that picks it and sets it up. I'm just sitting here as a fan trying like it would be so cool to watch a Ryder Cup where you know match 11 and 12 on Sunday like really sway the Ryder Cup one way or the other. Yeah I don't think I've ever seen that. And that hasn't happened at least in my short you know I mean I've been I guess dedicating my time to watching Ryder Cups for probably 10, 12 years now. So that's what, six ish Ryder Cups mm-hmm. that I've done that. And I don't, you can, someone can fact check me, but I don't think there's been one where it's like close, close on Sunday. So yeah, that's I just can. what I want to see, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I, I, I think there's something to that. Like this course clearly, again, I, I know there's the Americans and there's a lot of different player types. You have a Brian Harmon and you have a Scotty Scheffler. 
very different players, but clearly the Team Europe and their analytics-based approach and, and diving into the numbers and trying to find the right types of shots that help them win clearly did. Yep. Um, so, and then obviously you go back to Whistling Straits a couple years ago, same thing with the U.S. You had all these bombers. You had Bryson on the team, you know, driving greens from 380 yards. So there's, I, I again, I, I'm not demanding or, or it's just merely a thought. It's merely mm -hmm. a thought that um, I've looked back at past results and it's just like the home team right now is just winning convincingly every yeah. time. Yeah, it would certainly be interesting to see, like, if they could, like, maybe they should do, like, an exhibition Ryder Cup in, in the off season, Yeah. <laughs> and have have it completely, completely neutral, you know, neutral site, neutral setup, and, and just kind of see mm -hmm. if that changes anything. Right. I'm sure it would, mm -hmm. but then again, it's like, when it comes down to it, it's just the team that plays better is going to win. Yeah. And um, for whatever reason, you know, whether that's related to the the home advantage, that seems to be the way it's falling right now. Right. Yeah. Um, then one other thing we need to touch on, too, is sort of the rust factor that I know that came up a bunch. And I believe it was nine of 12 American players had not played competition golf for over a month. Mm -hmm. um, whereas you had Team Europe, I believe all of them played just a couple weeks ago competitively, uh, or two weeks prior to the Ryder Cup. So I guess how much do you think that played into the, uh, the I mean, immediate dominance Team Europe had on this, on this Ryder Cup? Yeah, I think it definitely gives them a competitive advantage. I mean, you've got, you've got guys that are you know, they're obviously the Americans are practicing and, you know, they're they're playing practice rounds and they're working out and they're doing their, their routine, but it's it's different than playing four rounds of competitive golf mm -hmm. where, you know, you've got that into like you said, that entire European team was playing events and and staying sharp mm -hmm. and that competitive mindset I think maybe not maybe, I think that definitely gave them gave them the edge as far as you know just kind of that mindset of, of competitive golf but mm -hmm. um yeah I, I i definitely think that that was a factor for sure the yeah. americans i mean yeah when was the last time scotty scheffler played a tournament right FedEx cup yeah i yeah. mean that's yeah and that's and that was most of them right right and i guess brooks had you know the live chicago last week Right, I think it was Brooks and Ohoma played in the Fortinet, and there was one yep. other, um, maybe Justin Thomas also played yeah. in the Fortinet, I think. I think so that's that was, it, though. I think that was the three guys that had played a competitive and event. And that was a couple of weeks ago, even. Right, so. so, which for Max, I mean, there's been arguments been made that, you know, he was, he benefited from playing recently. Brooks, besides the the big, you know, 9-7 and seven match, um, showed out pretty well. Yeah, 1-1-1, one, one, and one. I mean... So, That's not going to lose you the Ryder Cup. Right, but, you know, um, he was better than most of the Americans right. there. So there's, I, I, I think, moving forward, and then there's also the, the point made on the broadcast several times, too, which was the Italian Open that it was, I believe, hosted at that course. It was, year, yeah. Um, at Marco Simone or Simone? I heard both. Yeah, um, I, I just but, go Simone. But, um, <laughs> you know, the, a bunch of the European team went and played that. And they made the note several times that there was no American team members that played over there for That's that surprising. event. And so it's one of those, like, you know, how much does the U.S. really want this thing, this Ryder Cup, if the host course is having, you know, an event that any, any of those players could have played probably, and none of them want to go, you know, play an event there and get a feel for that place. Yeah. You know? That seems like it would have been a good idea. <laughs> yeah. And I wonder even like, you know, if some of these guys say like uh, Sam Burns or a Keegan Bradley or um, Cameron Young, you know, these guys that were kind of on the bubble. I know Sam Burns was one of the picks, but imagine if a Keegan Bradley or Cam Young went and played that event. Um, does that maybe change Zach Johnson's mind a little bit um, when he's making his captain's picks? Mm -hmm. You know, there's... I don't know, there's a lot of dynamics that went into it, and obviously now we have the benefit of hindsight, so it's tough to judge the decisions made too much. But just looking back, it's easy to poke holes and stuff and poke holes in the approach to the Ryder Cup on Team USA's side. But um, at the end of the day, it was a uh, tough loss that 
I mean, going into Sunday, you you just didn't see much of a way for Team USA to really compete. So that's, yeah, it was. I'm I'm almost speaking as not only a Team USA fan, but also as a as a golf watcher who wanted to watch an intense competition. Yeah, yeah, I think that was kind of a bummer in terms of you know viewing as a golf fan. It's just not as enjoyable when it's when it's not close like that and. You know, we, we've already mentioned it, but it's these big events like this. You want to see, you want to see tight competition, and you want to see it come down to the wire. And you know, it just that just wasn't the case. I mean, the, the Europeans just dominated from pretty much start to finish. I think the Europeans yeah. had four players that didn't even lose a match. Yeah, that's that's too many. Where the <laughs> that's not U.S. had none. Yeah. Um, I think I jotted that one down. Yeah, Hatton. Hovland, Rahm, and McIntyre were all undefeated. Uh, they all had ties, but, you know, that's not going to hurt you. Right. So just a dominant performance. And, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of expected the Europeans to win despite yeah, despite the odds and, yeah. and, you know, the well, teams, was, was how they look on paper. When we previewed it at the time, Team USA – was favored, but that did switch in the days after, leading up to the first tee shot. We're actually then at, at the first tee shot, Europe was the favored team, but it wasn't, you know, a big difference. Yeah. So there it was, was... kind of a pick em. Yeah, yeah. So I think, I wonder how that's going to transpire over the next couple of years as we lead up to Beth Page Black, between, you know, Europe's domination in this one, but then also just the historical trend of the home team yeah. Winning favorably in most cases. Yeah. So has there been a Ryder Cup at Beth Page? I'm not sure. I but can't think of I'm one. very excited for the noise in the crowd. Yeah. It'll be rowdy the there chaos for sure. That will happen um, from a New York centric oh, yeah. group of fans. Oh yeah. And they're gonna remember Oh, they'll remember this, this whole uh, yeah. this just Joel Acaba thing, right or wrong, you know, mm -hmm. I, I you, however you feel about that. But Rory was fired up about it. Um, it was, there was a little bit, I mean, again, if this was a tighter Ryder Cup, that would have been a much bigger story. I agree, 100%. Um, I'm, I'm kind of sad it was, it was as big a de deficit as it was, just mm -hmm. because that type of thing is, I, again, I don't know if LaCava was doing this on purpose. If you missed it, I'll kind of recap it a little bit in, in my best, um, I guess, my guess memory. My best memory here was, it was the 18th hole on Saturday evening. I think Saturday so, yeah. Saturday evening. Um, so this is the four ball matches. This is where Patrick Hanley had that strong, strong finish Saturday to earn a full point for Team USA to kind of keep their hopes alive. And Rory McIlroy and his partner, Matt Fitzpatrick, right, had a birdie putt to match Cantley's long one on 18 to get a, to get a half point. And as they're celebrating with the whole hat situation with Patrick Cantlay and, you know, LaCava's wandering around the middle of the green, waving his hat around, um, while McElroy and Fitzpatrick are trying to line their putts up and, and you know, try to have the, have the hole. And uh, McElroy took issue with that um, and kind of, you know, I, according to Luke Donald, politely asked him to move. I don't know if it, how polite it was, um, but... And LaCava didn't really move and actually got closer to McRoy. And then so it became a whole thing. And there was a, a video that was leaked of McRoy kind of trying to confront uh, actually Bones. And I think LaCava was in there too. And so it was a whole thing. Yeah, Bones was in there for some reason. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> anyway, again, I just wish that would have been more of a story because yeah. that's, that's like what golf needs. That's a rare need, for golf. The Ryder Cup needs a little bit of yeah, that. Yeah, there like, isn't a lot of heated moments like that in yeah. golf. So. I mean, there's there's too much. I mean, Ricky Fowler gave a two-foot, eight-inch putt yeah, to, to win, win the, Ryder the, the Ryder Cup. He concedes that's, that's it. That's being it's too like, nice. What are you I, doing? I mean, even if I'm a European fan, I want my guy to make the putt to right. win. Right. Yeah. Know? It's not as satisfying to yeah. just pick your ball up. Oh, we won. Yeah. You, know, you want to knock that thing in the middle and... Right. So, I... Uh, anyway, that's... Um, you're right, though. The New York fans won't forget that. Mm -hmm. If LaCava is caddying for that Ryder Cup, he'll have Which I'm he'll have his own group of fans with I'm him. I'm betting he will be. And, uh, yeah, whether it's Cantlay <laughs> or somebody else, I mean, he'll be there in some capacity, I would think. So. What would you think of the, the hat gate story for Cantlay? It's, it's so <laughs> funny. Um, I can see, I mean, again, we 
there's this dynamic that the U.S. doesn't care as much, and there might be some validity to it. I don't know for sure. I, again, I don't know these guys by any stretch of the imagination personally. Um, but I, if anybody's been following President's Cups, Ryder Cups the last few years, Canley hasn't worn a hat in any no. of them. So it's not like, I mean, to bring this up now when they have, they're off to a really rough start in the Ryder Cup is kind of convenient to mm -hmm. me as a, as a story. So... And I actually remember him at the 2021 Ryder Cup Westwing Straits. I think he had said the same thing in an interview at, at the time. He said the hat, was, the hat was too small. So <laughs> He's got a pretty big hat. I'm going to go with that story. You yeah. know, it seems like that's the, the best one. Um, but it was funny to see the European fans quickly mm -hmm. catch on to that and, yeah. and use it against him, which I love that. I mean, that's what the fans should be doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, Azinger was pretty was getting pretty heated about it. He, yeah. he kept bringing it up like, this story is a bunch of garbage. <laughs> you know, the U.S. locker room divided, and it's all a bunch of rubbish, blah, blah, blah. You kept bringing it up. I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, one other guy I wanted to mention just briefly was Ricky Fowler. He kind of just mentioned him there, conceding the Ryder Cup. But I was just disappointed, you know. After the season he had, I was kind of hopeful that he might be a spark for the U.S. team, come out strong and just – run yeah. the table I thought there was a chance of that but I think he only played two or three matches and right I know he didn't win any of them but he only played he just I wasn't think, really involved I think it was the very first session and then his Sunday singles and that was it yeah I thought that was very strange so yeah, and, and there was rumors about him being sick or if it was you know I think honestly it was just he was the the prime example of not being I mean of being rusty <laughs> and not having competed or, you know, and not unable to really show that he's, you know, can contribute to a winning match. And and then, of course, you throw out the Spieth-Thomas pairing over and over when it wasn't really working. Um, there's, you know, again, we have the benefit of hindsight. We could have tossed this thing around so many different ways. But at the end of the day, like the point you made, Europe just played better. Mm -hmm. They just played better. They hit better golf shots. They made more putts. I mean, every time I looked up on the screen, Justin Rose was making a 15 -footer. Oh, man. So, yeah, I forgot about him. He was, for his age, I mean, he looked good out there. He will be an excellent Ryder Cup captain. Yeah. Like, whatever U.S. captain has to go up against him is going to have a tall task. Yeah, I give it four years. Yeah. He'll probably play in the next one, and then... Yeah, maybe next one in Europe is Justin Rose. That'll be it. Yeah. That'll be a tough one yeah. for, for the U.S. Um, okay, so with that said now, I wanted to kind of – we talked about kind of the MVP of the U.S., which was Max Homa, and we talked about the MVP of Europe, at least in terms of points, was Rory McIlroy. So from there, I want, you, I, want to, I want you to give your favorite performance from – I know this might be a little tough to actually come up with now that – homeless off the table what I'm gonna say besides the MVPs your favorite performance from Team USA and Team Europe oh boy trying well, to find trying to find a favorite performance from the Americans yeah tall order yeah um, I'll actually go with Brian Harmon yeah I thought he was solid I mm -hmm. think he was two and two on the week uh, you know that's obviously better than most of the team mm -hmm. and you know for a Ryder Cup rookie and uh, a guy, a guy like him, I, I was impressed with with what he was able to do out there, and um, you know, I think, I think the Americans could have used a little more of that kind of Harmon mentality, yeah. that grit and that that fire. But so I'll go Harmon for the Americans, and um, I really just like Robert McIntyre, so I'll say him for the Europeans. Yeah. Um, didn't lose a match, Ryder Cup rookie. Um, yeah, he's just good, man. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I also really, Tommy Fleetwood would be my other one. He's like, he's turning, he's kind of turning into one of those guys that every Ryder Cup, like he's one of the best performers. Mm -hmm. It seems like Team Europe just has that with guys. Like <laughs> there's, you kind of think of maybe Justin Thomas as sort of the, you, the Ryder Cup, you know, guy for the u.s right the the go-to player you know if you were to need one hole or one shot mm -hmm. the guy that's going to do it and rise to the occasion is going to be justin thomas but it seems like europe has like a lot of those guys i think tommy fleetwood is 
the next Ian Poulter. Yeah. <laughs> like, I he mean, can't win a PGA Tour event. <laughs> yeah, you're right. But every year at the Ryder Cup, he's, like, mm-hmm. unbeatable. Mm-hmm. They're both English. You might be onto something with that Fleetwood's one. Fleetwood's got a little bit more hair. Just a little bit. But, yeah, it's... But you're, I mean, you got Fleetwood. Justin Rose seems to always play well at the Ryder Cup. Mm-hmm. You have Rory, who clearly has expressed how much he cares about this event, and John Rahm is doing the same now. They just they they're gonna they're gonna show up every every two years, yep. and they're gonna do their part. So that, Patton's been really good. Yeah. Um, on my end, I wanted to I wanted to give props to Sam Burns for the way he kicked off the second session on Saturday, sort of. Getting out to that hot start, I think he was paired with Morikawa. Yeah, in four ball. They played a really good. I was and probably the, the they, best played match. Yeah, the way the that Americans. they took control of it early and didn't really let go of it. Yeah, I I also like that he sort of fed into the crowd a little bit and kind of, you know, it was a little bit of a spark for Team USA in that regard, and they needed one at the time. So, yep, um, that'll be my sort of favorite performance was kind of that match between, mm-hmm. you know, with Burns and Morikawa. Yeah, I'm with the, you there. The Team USA desperately needed one. Yeah. They, they showed up. I think it was, was it McElroy and Fitzpatrick they played against I in that so. one? I think so. I think that was Rory's one loss. Yeah, yeah, so Rory's one loss the whole week um, was that one. So kudos to those guys for delivering there. And then on the Europe side, I'm going to go back to Justin Rose just because I there's something about a guy who, again, I, I'm not really exaggerating. I mean, I am, but every time... I looked up and he was facing with a you know a ten to fifteen footer to either have or win a hole. I mean, it seemed like he made it every time. Yeah. It was absurd how well he putted. I don't know exactly what the strokes gain numbers are. I know there was you know like Data Golf is tracking those and stuff, but it had to be off the charts the way he was putting. And you know every time he would give a pretty good reaction and, and get the crowd going. Um, that's a leader of that team. Yeah. And so for him to. You know, he had a couple rough years of competition. He's now back. He won Pebble Beach this year. Um, that was it was fun to see him kind of, you know, find find what he had back in you know when he was in the world number one. Yeah, he was found that he was. He's vintage. not the longest guy out there. He's not going to strike the ball the best, but he'll score well if he needs to score well. Yeah, and like you said, he makes the putts, makes the putts that count, and in Ryder Cups, I mean. You get a hot putter. That's that's gonna mm-hmm. bode pretty well for your your chances. So and then one other thing I wanted to ask you about, sort of the most pivotal moment of the Ryder Cup. Like it could have been right away that first session, or w- maybe what was the one moment where you saw this unfold and you were like, all right, I, that's kind of where I draw the line. I think U.S. won't over- overcome that. Um, I forget the entire. I forget like what the exact match was, but it was I believe Friday morning or Saturday morning. Sorry, there was that match with Rom, where he chipped in like four times. Yep. <laughs> and I was watching that, and I was just like, yeah. "This is ridiculous!" Like, then he had he had the one uh, on the par three that yep. hit the stick yeah. and almost went in. Like it, every shot he hit was like. And then he had Hitting that the flag. eagle putt on 18 that yeah. was probably going to fly 15 feet by, but it hit the back of the cup and uh, dropped in. Yeah, he just kept chipping in and holing out from everywhere. I was just like, "This is, this is, this is over." <laughs> yeah, I think I can't. I think I want to say that was Friday afternoon, maybe. Yeah, it might have been because that was gonna. What I was gonna say for this was just the way the Americans closed Friday afternoon on 18. Because I think the all three, the, the first three of the four matches in that four ball session, the U.S. led most of the day. Mm-hmm. And they got to 18, and you had Hovland make that long putt for birdie that yep. won them that hole and earned a half. I think Justin Rose made a putt that earned them a half, and then John Rahm um, earned a half as well with that long eagle putt. And those flipped from one up wins for Team USA to suddenly all ties. Yeah. And then I think Europe ended up winning that fourth match of that session. So it went from, you know, a US three to one winning that session to I don't know what the math is, I'm blanking what, two and a half to one and a half in favor of Europe mm-hmm. in that session, which is a huge turnaround 
and yeah. suddenly it's you know it was you like go seven from, to two or something yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah, you go from, <clears throat> I mean, a pretty crazy what could have been like what five to three after mm -hmm. eight points down. Suddenly it's six and a half to one and a half. That's big difference. Yeah. So um, that's uh, that's where I noticed the the big turnaround there. It was just the, the whole week Americans didn't play eighteen well. You had Scotty on Sunday, you know, kind of making a, a you know rough par to have with Rom. It was uh, it was rough out there. Yeah, for, and that for the shot hole. that that Scotty one you just mentioned was just so weird. Like you get him greenside like that, and with his short game, it's like usually it's like a gimme up and down. I know. Or yeah. like he's gonna. Like, I think he had a weird lie. Yeah, I remember, yeah. but I mean, still that's. With what was on the line there, you got to get up and down. Yeah. Uh, I this, think that actually was probably the point where. Yeah, you kind of realized this is just. Yeah. <clears throat> if he wins that match, you know, maybe it's a different story. But, yeah, he had to have that one for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they always, I mean, it's tough to quantify momentum and put a number on it and what it actually means. But I have to imagine mentally for the, for the U.S., just seeing red on the board from Scotty that first match, taking down John Rahm, holding him off, would have given a little bit of a confidence boost, and who knows what could have changed after mm -hmm. that. Yeah, that was a pretty deflating moment, I think, when, when that one ended in a tie. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think at that point, the Europeans only needed, what, three points, two points after that? Yeah. Out of the, the 11 other matches, so... Yeah. Um, all right. So we're going to start wrapping up here, but I wanted to get asked, you know, is there any other, yeah, I know you got your notepad of, sh of stats here. So Let's see if I missed anything. Any big ones that need to be mentioned here that we maybe didn't talk about or didn't. Well, didn't touch I on? mean, I mentioned that there was four Europeans that didn't lose a single match. Mm -hmm. On the flip side of that, we had three Americans that failed to win a single match. That's, yeah, that's not a great look. So that's, I know Scotty Scheffler is Scotty Scheffler, 0-2-2. Oh, two two. Jordan Spieth, 0-2-2. Oh, two and, two. <clears throat> and Ricky Fowler, 0-2. Oh, yeah. That kind of just sums it up right there. Especially when two of those guys played four sessions. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then we mentioned kind of Max Homa was the only American with a winning record. Definitely the American MVP. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's about all I got on here. Yeah, I think we I think we nailed all the big, big talking points. We covered the, uh, the Lacava story, the, and the dust up. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think uh, I'm excited for 2025. It's at Beth Page. That crowd's gonna be nuts. Um, I hope I I mean, as a fan of golf, I hope it's close. For as a fan of Team USA, I'm hoping for another home team blowout. I think it'll be close, and I say that because. As of now, I feel like the European Ryder Cup team is better. Yeah. But in 2025, you got to factor in the home course advantage. So maybe that brings the the margin right. kind of right to the middle. Well, and, and just so much changes in a couple <clears throat> of years. I mean, we Right. The teams will be Yeah. probably different. I mean, we were like we were convinced after Whistling Straits that Team USA wouldn't lose a Ryder Cup for 10 years. Mm -hmm. How dominant that was, record-setting performance. And it seemed like Europe's sort of, um, I guess their nucleus of players was a little bit weaker than normal. And mm -hmm. then suddenly now you have Holland rise to the top five of the world. Yeah. McElroy and Rahm are still dominant. You know, Tyrrell Hatton stayed steady. Fleetwood was at the time maybe regressing, but now he's back towards peak of his powers. So there's a lot can change, but that'll be fun. Yeah, looking be fun. forward to it for sure. Well, Pierce, thank you for joining and recapping a very eventful, but very chaotic and ultimately disappointing for the U.S. side Ryder Cup. Um, stay tuned to the Second Swing YouTube channel and stay tuned to the Second Swing Docs podcast for more content coming soon. Uh, but Pierce, always a pleasure. Yep. Thanks for having me.